And thank you for your patience as we are obviously mm -hmm. fine tuning some technical difficulties. Um, Sarah Horowitz is joining us via Zoom today and we're really glad that we were able to make it work so that she could be here. Um, my name is Tammy Kenny. I am the culture editor at Seville Weekly. I'm pleased to be here today in conversation with Betsy Priolo. Perfect. <laughs> Sarah Horowitz. Impossible. We man. practice. We practice. Um, I want to let you know that the Virginia Festival of the Book is a program of Virginia Humanities, a statewide organization whose mission is to connect people and ideas to explore the human experience. In a few minutes, we'll introduce the panelists, but first, please silence your cell phones, and we encourage you to be aware of your space and look around, taking notes of the exits, which are that way to the right and straight back. Um, Oop, we lost our place. Um, we have a bookseller on site, and our authors will be signing after the program. We encourage you to meet our authors by getting your book signed. And we'd like to thank Virginia Festival of the Book's premier sponsor, Michelle and David Baldacci. Many festival events are free of charge, but not free to produce, and your support helps. You can give using one of the QR codes designated for giving. <coughs> And we also need your input. So right before our audience Q&A, you'll receive surveys to fill out. These surveys are immensely helpful, so we encourage you to do so. Remember that festival authors are speakers, and they represent themselves, and they do not represent Virginia Huma Humanities or the University of Virginia. <laughs> and with that, I am delighted to introduce today's panelists. Betsy Priolo is an author and a cultural historian with a PhD in American literature from Duke University, who has taught at Manhattan College and New York University. Besides essays and scholarly articles, she is the author of four books, Seductress, Women Who Have Ravished the World and Their Lost Art of Love, Swoon, Great Seducers and Why <laughs> Women Love Them, Circle of Eros, Sexuality in the Work of William Dean Howells, and most recently, Diamonds and Deadlines, <laughs> A Tale of Greed, Deceit, and a Female Tycoon in the Gilded Age, which was a New York Times editor's choice and Wall Street Journal's noteworthy book. Welcome, Betsy. Thank you. Um, <laughs> on screen today, we have Sarah Horowitz, who, a professor of history at Washington and Lee University and head of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program. She teaches classes on the history of France, gender and sexuality, crime and scandal, and is the author of The Red Widow, The Scandal That Shook Paris and The Wom Woman Behind It All. She's also written Friendship and Politics in Post-Revolutionary France. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post as well as Nursing Cleo, and she lives in Virginia with her wife and their wildly overconfident dog. <laughs> I think we're going to start out um, with something from Betsy, and we will we'll need your technical abilities. Well, first of all, I'm going to say thank you for the great introduction, and it's so cool that all of you came out on this raw day to hear about Mrs. Frank Leslie. <laughs> You're going to hear a lot now. <laughs> this is a quick visual tour, so this will just kick off some conversation, I hope. So uh, Diamonds and Deadlines is the story of the Empress of Journalism, one of the most remarkable and revolutionary women of the 19th century. Miriam Leslie, Mrs. Frank Leslie, was a feminist trailblazer who scrapped and conned her way from nothing in a brutal misogynistic world to become a media giant and tastemaker of the Gilded Age. No woman had ever gone so far before but no woman, I suspect, has ever been so forgotten. But in her day, and let's see, how is this going to, this is supposed to advance here. Uh, well, we go to the next slide. Hmm. Let's see, is it on? No, it's off. Here we go. Maybe this goes. Aha! <laughs> 
Uh, yes. Uh, so you can see there that uh, she is on none of the roll calls of famous American women. You know what? This is the other. This is the other uh, PowerPoint. This is the thirty-minute one. I don't think you want that. <laughs> well, skip through. Okay. We'll All right. <laughs> we'll skip right. Improvise. We will come. We will skip right through this. Uh, so, um, in her time, even though she is forgotten today completely, she was one of the most famous women in America, a national celebrity, and a phenomenon. When middle class women were angels in the house, like this pitiful a woman below, confined to the private sphere, denied equality, and financial independence. She owned and ran the largest publishing company in America on cutthroat male terrain for 20 years. She steered the Frank Leslie publishing empire to nationwide supremacy. This is just a sample of some of her publications. Bailed it out of bankruptcy twice and made a fortune as she was the sixth wealthiest woman in America and a brilliant, businesswoman. Besides that, uh, she was um, an accomplished woman of letters, a blue stocking, as they said. Then she was the author of six books uh, and a play. She was a professional lecturer, a scholar, a translator. Uh, you can see her translations there on the right. Um, and the peculiar thing about all of this is that everything that she did was an anathema to the patriarchal status quo. Brains desexed a woman, and commerce was a male preserve. Yet, Mrs. Frank Leslie was a high powered captain of industry. We're going to move on here. <laughs> We're going to go back. <laughs> high powered, yes, here we are. Uh, a high powered, a high powered captain of industry who ran the company like a field marshal. Nine department heads reported to her each day, and she monitored every aspect of the business. She vetted editorials and story submissions, proof manuscripts, approved makeup, and oversaw 400 employees and as many as 12 publications. If her public career violated established feminine norms, her private life was even more transgressive. In an era of, let's go find a nice slide to show you this. In an era of, well, we can try this one. <laughs> In an era of enforced female purity, she was, as they said in those days, a free luster, a flagrant free luster with a sex life out of a tabloid expose. There were dozens of lovers. Uh, the other slide shows them all together so that you can see this conglomeration. But um, let's just say there were, um, there were, besides dozens of lovers, there were four uh, marriages almost five, three divorces, adulterous affairs. I'm going to show you a picture of one of these guys. It was just incredible. <laughs> this was right after she, this is, <laughs> this is the famous a swashbuckling poet of the day, Joachim Miller, the Byron of the Rockies. Uh, they had an adulterous affair that lasted on and off for 30 years. <laughs> and in addition to that, there was a 10-year menage a trois with two men, um, E.G. Square and Frank Leslie. 
So how she got away with it was a miracle. It was miraculous in every respect. She adopted the guise of, and I'll get you to see, if I'll get you a good picture of that too. Uh, wrong direction. You'll have to, <laughs> this is a long one. If you want the long one, you really, she adopted the guise of, you know, this is perfect. She adopted the guise of the ideal patriarchal lady and traded on the privileges of her sex and her pedestaled position to subvert opposition and get her way. She was also a, a mistress of secrets. And one of her big secrets was her past. Instead of an aristocratic Louisiana lady raised on a plantation, she really came from a disheveled, hard knock background. Born illegitimate in 1836, she was almost certainly the daughter of one of the enslaved women her father brought from Charleston, South Carolina to New Orleans. This is a list of possible candidates that turned up by accident in the Charleston Public Library. She grew up in poverty in a house that probably looked something like this. Deadbeat father who'd long lost his slaves and his common law wife, Susan, who kept a parlor house for men, no questions asked, and this was a euphemism for a brothel. Uh, there were um, years that she didn't want to talk about in the sex trade and a long trail of sordid intrigues. Another secret, um, again, I'd love to talk more about this one, was her commitment to feminism. Although she scoffed at suffragists, um, she said they were not often calmly, uh, seldom attractive, and abhorred the society of men. And although her public commitment was to uh, a conservative brand of feminism, a, a kind of cuttlefish, oblique approach to female power, she dropped a bombshell when she died. She left the bulk of her $2 million fortune, which would be around 50 million in today's money, to women's suffrage, the largest amount ever given. And the legacy actually rescued um, the 19th Amendment just when the movement was fractured and circling the drain. Miriam Leslie isn't the most lovable female exemplar. She um, was, like many uh, grandiose personalities, complex and flawed. But she was a titanic vanguard figure of huge charisma, strength of character, and chutzpah who tore up the feminine script, faked out the patriarchy, and sidewinded to unimaginable uh, power and influence. Um, she built her own empire in command of herself, her money, and her narrative. Uh, the woman of the future, she loved to say, is the power of the future. And she'd like women today to have more of it, all of it. But I think she'd like to be remembered, too. Um, both for her fantastic story and as one of the pioneer female power players and feminists of history. I mean, a, a, a publicity diva, she would hate to be forgotten. So uh, we can now move yeah. on to some. We'll talk about that. Uh, some questions length. about that at length. Yes, Thanks great. So much. Um, and so now we'd like to um, turn to our Zoom screen and, and let Sarah give us some background on the Red Widow. Ta-da. Mm -hmm. 
found out. Mm -hmm. Did this show up? Yeah. Yay. Yay. Yes. Yay. Mm -hmm. So I am so sorry I cannot be there with folks in person. I woke up with a totally disgusting cold. Um, and uh, not really going far from my house today, if even outside at all. Um, but I'm so grateful to be here, and I'm uh, really grateful um, to Tammy for moderating and for all of you to coming, even if I can't be there with you in person. And so I want to tell you um, a little bit about a uh, similarly scandalous woman, um, but in another country. And I first came across her about 12 years ago. When I was on a tour of Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, and as we passed by the tomb of Félix Faure, who was president of France in the 1890s, and you can see a picture of his tomb here, our tour guide couldn't resist telling us that Faure died of a stroke when he was having sex with his mistress. And then the tour guide went on to say that a few years later, the mistress's husband and mother were murdered, and the guide strongly implied that the mistress might have had something to do with the murders. Now, I had trouble believing it at the time. Um, this seemed too improbable to be true. It seemed like the kind of wild urban legend that French people like to tell about politicians. But I'm uh, trained to do my research. And so I started reading a small number of books about this woman, whose name was Marguerite or Meg Stenow. And I learned that actually the tour guide had been telling the truth. And then once I got into the archives in Paris, I realized that no one knew how bananas the whole story of her life was, um, that it was truly a case of truth being stranger than fiction. Meg was a femme fatale who left a trail of death and destruction in her wake. She broke every rule in the book, including lying, blackmailing, maybe a little light poisoning, um, and very definitely framing innocent individuals for murder and she got away with it. So to give you a taste of the story, before she was unleashing havoc on French society, Meg was a bored housewife in her 20s in the Paris of the 1890s. She was married to a mediocre artist, almost twice her age, who she didn't love, and was facing the prospect of years of domestic drudgery while her husband pursued affairs with both women and men. And I've included a postcard uh, that includes her, her husband, and then their daughter. Meg, understandably, wasn't terribly content with this faith. So to alleviate her loneliness and the financial strain in her household, and to enter a Parisian high society, she undertook a series of affairs um, and her lovers, again, I think both women and men, in the 1890s and the 18, uh, 1900s. And these were a veritable who's who of the elite. They were judges, powerful officials, politicians, industrialists, maybe even a member of a royal family or two. And her most famous conquest was indeed Félix Faure, the president buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery, who did in fact die of a stroke that he had during one of their assignations. Nine years after he died, Meg returned to the spotlight in a really dramatic fashion. Her husband and mother were found in their home, dead of apparent strangulation, and she was actually the sole survivor of the attack and the only witness. But the details of her story and the crime scene just didn't match up. And so the question became how far she go to clear her name and how far the authorities would go to protect a member of the elite. And I don't want to give too many spoilers, uh, but the answer to both questions is very, very far. So this is a book, um, if you like to say Bridgerton, um, but wanted the story to be true, to have murder, um, for everyone to be terrible, and for there no uh, to be no happy endings, um, this would be the book for you. Um, I think it's also, you know, it's a true crime book, um, and Meg is kind of a girl boss gone wrong. She's sort of like Elizabeth Holmes. Um, she's ambitious, energetic, has tons of hustle, really, really smart but she didn't quite use her talents for the best purposes, and she really couldn't stop lying. So this is a story that takes place in the years around 1900, even as I think it has a lot of contemporary resonances. 
It's a story about sex, power, scandal, rumor, corruption, elites behaving badly, grifters, conspiracy theories, and a criminal justice system that was invested in protecting elites and punishing the poor. Um, But above all, it's a story of a woman who was both a victim and a villain who often did terrible things. She was a force of utter chaos, but she is never, ever boring. Sarah, are you able to hear me? Okay. Okay. So what what came to mind for me as I was reading these books is these women, I mean, we're here, scandalous ladies of the 19th century, but are they really scandalous or are they just super amazing, tenacious women? Um, <laughs> you know, they are um, they're outliers in the 19th century society, but even more so incredibly resilient, scrappy, and determined. Um, I found both Miriam and Marguerite, the two um, women in the two books, just fascinating. Um, Power, success, social climbing, all that they achieved, and especially how they used their gender, and they wielded sex as um, a weapon in a lot of situations. One question, um, we were going to talk a little bit to both authors uh, and have them comment on the same subject because the, between the two, you know, Miriam and Marguerite, they're born 31 years apart. They're on different continents, uh, but they have so much in common. So um, maybe start, something that fascinated me was the way they each manipulated the media to their advantage in those days. That something that is is, you know, ever present in our culture today, um, they were early influencers. <laughs> so um, Betsy, if you don't mind taking that question first and yeah. maybe pointing out a couple of ways, you know, um, uh, Mrs. Frank Leslie was uh, operating from within. Yeah, well, she was the queen of spin and she owned the media. So bear in mind that she could create whatever image she wanted through the press. She was a genius in that respect. Um, She was able to fabricate an identity that matched the true woman ideal of the period. And behind that masquerade, she could do whatever she wanted. This woman was so successful that newspapers hailed her as you know, the representative woman of the time, look at her. She's beautiful, she's feminine, and look what she can also do. Uh, meanwhile, she was operating like a very tough commander at work and getting her way all the time, uh, especially sexually. So she even had a fan club, so she's even more of an influencer. <laughs> And today, think of the number of followers she would have racked up. (laughs) She was a genius in that respect. So she had an advantage, I think, um, over uh, her other uh, counterpart in France because she didn't have to work in a sidewinding fashion with the media. She could actually create the person she intended to be. but again, she was such a pro at that. I, it was incredible. Um, just in follow up, did she have rivals in terms of you mean direct female. competitors that were um, male or female? Obviously, in the publishing industry, she would have. You mean women who were? She had several women like Madame Demarest, who ran a very fas- a very popular. Uh, women's magazine, and there was Godey's Ladies Book, but she was such a smart journalist. She knew how to outstrip them. Uh, She introduced uh, many things in the fashion world, including being a mannequin de monde, where she got outfits from couturiers, modeled them, and then put them in her magazine. 
uh, none of the other competitors f figured that out. And she also would sell a look in her fashion magazines. She was the fashion arbiter, the Anna Win Wintour of her, her time. Um, and she was extremely innovative in the press that way. Sarah, are you Sarah, able you to, to um, take that uh, question down the Yeah, this is such a great question. So I think Meg, you know, unlike um, Mrs. Frank Leslie, she just didn't have the same amount of control. And so for her, the press is something that she at times courts and at times hides from and at times um, they turn on her and she ends up uh, not, um, it doesn't work well for her. Um, so for instance, after the murders, um, she basically tries to hide out from the press and um, they're kind of hinting that her story isn't adding up, that the police must be helping her cover up the murders. Um, and, you know, her friends really shun her as a result. Um, and, you know, say like, we can't kind of see you unless um, your name is cleared. Um, and so six months after the murders, she goes back to the press um, and she lies to journalists. And she says that the police are about to solve the case. And that's not true at all. Um, and then when that it's clear that that's not true, she plants evidence on one of her servants and she has um, a journalist find that evidence. She sort of stages these themes with journalists. Um, and, you know, so everyone thinks, well, he must have done it. Like, you know, Meg is absolutely innocent. But then her jeweler goes to the police and says, I know she was lying about her story because of something I saw in the newspapers. And that actually ends up with her being arrested. Um, and so I think, you know, she's, it's really fascinating. I think in certain senses, she just can't control um, this kind of, you know, press that is so eager for a kind of really juicy scandal with a sexy woman at the center of it. Uh, and it ends up turning on her in a uh, really, really dramatic fashion. How public were, were the sex lives of these women? How public? Public in terms of, I mean, your research has um, turned up some interesting stories. Well, well, were these known at the time? Or they how, how were they hiding? I mean, it, it, to have this public image um, and not be shunned and torn apart. Yeah, I'm curious about that. This brings up an interesting uh, question about concealing your life from the press. Because there were two exposés during Miriam's lifetime. One was an ex-husband who was rightfully furious with her. And that was in 1876 and 1878. And the other one was in 1886. All of her love, the whole thing was exposed to the public, especially the 10-year menage a trois and the affair. But Miriam had a different approach. She just rose above it. She denied it and printed uh, very, very um, self-congratulatory pieces in her fashion magazine that, you know, a, a woman who is wronged is to be totally pitied and look at all these aspersions and so on. She went on and on about it and made so much noise. And then, of course, Frank Leslie covered up uh, the first expose. The second one, she was left alone to deal with. And again, she just rose above it. She decided she would be Catherine the Great and just um, deny everything and keep going. Um, and pretend that it was all false. But uh, these affairs that she had were all well documented. And again, uh, when she had the affair with Joachim Miller, the Byron of the Rockies, he was fairly open about it. He wrote 
Love Poems Tour to Leslie. He featured her in a, a, a fabulous novel, The One Fair Woman is the Most Matchless and Magnificent Woman in the World. Everybody sort of knew about it. The only person who didn't was her husband, which was very peculiar. <laughs> he said, oh, they're lies, lies. And she said, of course, they're lies. But she was a very clever woman. Um, she spent part of her youth, her checkered youth, in the theater. And so she was uh, a, a consummate uh, performer and actress. So she was able to conceal uh, that affair for 30 years. Um, although uh, everybody knew about it at some level. Um, and as far as the other lovers were concerned, and there were scads of them, they kept cropping up in various court cases and all the rest of it. Um, but uh, she again denied it. And she said, oh, these are just friends or whatever. But uh, there's plenty of evidence they weren't just friends. In fact, there was one Louisiana, quote, pretty boy she installed in her hotel, the Gerlach. And, <laughs> and that only came up because the pretty boy got arrested and he handed over his diary, <laughs> which, was, <laughs> which she promptly uh, retrieved. But um, yeah, it, it, it was amazing how she was able to live this extraordinary um, wild, uh, polyamorous love life and get away with it. It's pretty extraordinary. But then again, she was a, 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 a woman unto herself who was a consummate, consummate um, actress and PR pro. Sarah, do you want to speak on that? Um... Yeah. Such a great question. So um, for a long time, you know, all the information about her affairs just circulated as gossip in Parisian society. Um, so, you know, you had to be in the know to know how the Felix Bach had died um, or what it meant when someone said that, uh, you know, she was friends with an important politician. Um, but then once she's arrested, uh, everything becomes public. And it's actually it was pretty shocking to me. And, you know, I'm hard to shock. I think I'm hard to shock. Um, I was reading newspapers from the days after she was arrested, which were talking in quite graphic detail about um, her last assignation with Paul. And, you know, I was like, wow, I, I can't believe I'm, you know, reading so much like graphic detail. Um, you know, and things like that uh, she had left, left her corset behind um, as she fled the Elysee Palace, which is the French equivalent of the White House, um, once Faure started having a stroke, um, or that uh, he was gripping her hair so tightly um, as he was having the stroke that his aides had to cut her um, hair out uh, uh, to release her. So, um, yeah, it was really uh, wild that it came out. Um, but I think for a long time, it was just the sort of thing that if you were in the know, you would know um, and sort of gossip about at various, um, you know, parties and in cafes. Can I just say something about that? Because sexual mores were different in Paris than in the Gilded Age. So that if you were a married woman and you had discreet affairs, isn't it true that that was pretty much accepted? I mean, there wasn't the same stigma as Miriam would have faced. Yes, absolutely. So she, it's really, it was really important that she maintained that sort of facade of um, propriety. Um, but she, other than that, she could, you know, more or less do what she wanted. So the way she hid her affairs initially from her family was saying that she was going to go visit her aunt Lily, um, who was this mysterious aunt who no one could ever meet, um, but who was very generous with her um, and sent her home with money and jewelry. And, you know, it's hard for me to think that anyone believes it, but I think what was really important is that she was showing that she cared about the codes of morality enough to lie, even if the lie wasn't believable. Yeah, 
I think if anyone had caught Miriam, she would have been sent off to an asylum <laughs> and, and, and had an oovorectomy and a clitorectomy. <laughs> the standard treatment for sexual um, aberrant behavior in that day. Wow. Yeah. Um, I want to turn a little bit and ask you if um, you could talk a little bit about your process and your research. These are incredibly well-researched books and <clears throat> the the detail is vivid despite, um, you know, with the volume of information that you had to comb through. So maybe talk about how long it took and anything that you may have encountered um, that was memorable. Wow, this was the most fun. There were so many rabbit holes, <laughs> you, you can't imagine. Uh, everything about Mrs. Frank Leslie was concealed under lots and lots of layers so that um, when I found her f second husband's letters in the New York Historical Society, it was amazing. Uh, I found out that he had syphilis, for example, and had probably given it to her, which is why she never had children. And that led to other discoveries. The biggest one was in, Char in Charleston, South Carolina, where this list by accident cropped up that showed the possible enslaved women who might have been her mother. Um, in fact, the key librarian there said he could put his finger on just who it was. And this was amazing because there was a huge court case when she left all of her money to suffrage. That will was contested by Frank Leslie's children on the basis that she was a mulatto and that the will was invalid. Of course it wasn't, but at any rate, at the end, the judge said, we can't prove anything, but he said, I can't discount the possibility that it's true. But nobody, it was, a, it was a dead trail. Nobody could figure it out. So that was cool, you know, to come up again, to see that document was really amazing. Uh, but the court cases, oh my God, that's where Google comes in. I could, I could get my hands on all the old court cases. One was a thousand pages and in it were testimonies. And so the whole picture suddenly came alive uh, through at least four court. The, the Gilded Age was a very contentious period. People were always taking problems to court and she went to court at least five times. So I had all of that data, all of those witnesses telling stories about our lovers, telling this and that. So um, that was, uh, to me, uh, wonderful. In addition to um, newspaper.com, if you, if you have ever used it, it's gem, because you can put in any date you want, any, any person, and you can get all of the old newspapers. And I could also, uh, there's a place in Maryland that's kept all of the Frank Leslie Illustrated papers. So all of that material was not available when Miriam's first biography was written in 1950. So it was really fun. It was the most enjoyable um, research I've almost ever done. Uh, the whole book took me four years, but uh, I would say the research was three. Sounds fun. Sarah? Sarah? Yeah, like Betsy, I had just the best time doing research for this book. So I was really lucky that I had a lot of sources for it. Um, Meg wrote her memoirs, but they're completely unreliable. She lied her entire life. Um, her memoirs are wildly anti-Semitic and she keeps blaming Jews for the murders. Um, but, you know, they're still interesting in terms of her mindset. Um, there's also really substantial press coverage. Uh, the case was in and out of the news for an 18 month period in an era when there were almost uh, 80 dailies in Paris alone. Um, and this was, you know, it was front page news um, for months at a time. And then what was most interesting to me was actually a incomplete police records um, from their investigation. Um, and, you know, none of these sources were telling the truth. And so I had this problem of there's I just didn't know what to believe in certain cases. And so I had to figure out what was the most likely story or what matched with other accounts. 
Um, but you know, the police were trying to cover up a crime. This was an era when the press had no professional standards and they would just print rumors. Um, and you know, Meg was a woman who lied her entire life. So it's not as if her memoirs were really, uh, reliable. Um, but I did have these incredible aha moments, um, particularly when I was looking at the police file, um, when it became really clear from the timeline that the police were helping her cover up even when they knew she was lying and that they couldn't, they were not able to pin it on anyone else, although they tried and they tried to help her in that. Um, and then most fascinatingly, and you know, these are, they're just sort of hints. It's just like something weird in the document there where I think they're saying that they're actively engaging in a cover up and that they know it. Um, and they know something is really weird about this case. Um, and so it was really interesting to me to think about, you know, like the, those records have been preserved. Um, and they, I guess like they wanted them preserved to, for people to say like, yeah, we knew that she was lying, but we still had to engage in this cover up. Um, so yeah, I, I also just had such a blast, um, researching this and learning about all of this, all the scandals of the, um, Belle Epoque Paris. Thank you. We have a, a, about 10 more minutes, and I want to turn to the audience and see who has questions for Betsy and Sarah. So mentioning the corset made me think, this was an era where women could not easily dress themselves or undress themselves alone. So were servants involved in all of this, in the cover-ups? And the, were there, was there blackmail? Was there... That, that was a secret keeping beyond the principles. That is a really excellent question. <laughs> a good observation. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's never mentioned. Um, obviously, there were servants because Miriam, once she rose in the world and she rose horizontally this way, she became very, very wealthy. And Frank Leslie was, of, of course, a media mogul himself. So there must have been a fleet of servants. I, I'm not really sure how to answer that because obviously she was all over the place with, with men and affairs and the rest of it. I'm sure bribery was extremely common. Um, and again, if you think about poverty in the Gilded Age where 90% of the population lived below the poverty level at $360 a year, these people were really scared of losing their jobs. And I can imagine the threats involved. I mean, that would be America. I cannot answer for Paris, again, it was a much more lenient society. I mean, if you were married. <laughs> Sarah, really were you question. able to hear that question? I was, and it's an amazing question. So Meg had two servants. Um, she had a cook and then she had a valet. Um, and uh, the, her cook was her confidant um, and helped facilitate her affairs. Um, she, The cook was actually the one who took the money so that Meg didn't have to because that would be sort of, um, you know, cast her out from high society. Um, I don't think that uh, the cook was bound to her by money because actually Meg ended up owing the cook a lot of money. Um, but I do think that Meg had a lot of patronage pull and power within the French government to sort of make things happen for people. And she would make things happen for servants and their families. Um, and you know, she's also very charming, uh, and I think quite fun to be around. So I think that's sort of why her, um, her cook seemed to have a kind of personal affection for her. The valet's more complicated because he was in the house when the murders were committed. Um, he was, uh, in sort of two stories above where they were committed. That was the sleeping quarters. Um, but he found, um, you know, he's the one to kind of find the bodies and say, find Meg tied up the morning after the murders. Um, and uh, it seems to me quite likely that she told him, um, you know, said, like, if you don't say anything and help me out, then I will do everything I can to help you. 
Um, he's a, you know, kind of poor kid um, from the um, the provinces. And I think she was tr- trying to help him become a, a like a chauffeur. Um, and um, but she turns on both of those servants. So she frames the valet and she plants evidence on him. And then once that's discovered, she blames the cook's son. Um, and, uh, you know, um, that's quickly, you know, discovered that that's not true either. Um, but it, it was really interesting. I don't think she was being blackmailed, um, but I think she was making promises. And I don't know that she was always delivering on those promises to her servants. Other questions? I really enjoyed the... Um learning about the pearl ice powder. I had, I, I, we read, I read the personal librarian, which had some of the same mm-hmm. issues of passing kind of thing. Right. And um, I had not heard of the pearl ice powder, even where I wrapped it in the ships. But I also wondered if you had talked to uh, the Gilded Age producers of the program. She would be such an amazing character in that program. Have you approached it? Do you know, every time I give a talk, People say the same thing. I mean, it's a, well, I, I, there, there's there's somebody who's shopping it, but you know, uh, it, it's a, it's a very tough world uh, to navigate right now because there's costume. This is what my agent said: that uh, costume dramas cost a lot of money. And people are loath to commit to something like that. It takes a long time for these projects to develop and so on. But I mean, it almost could be another character in that. It, yeah, it's yeah. Well, going. well, in the Gilded Age, uh, one of the characters is is portrayed reading the Frank Leslie Illustrated, <laughs> and I thought. What she deserves a, 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 at least a star turn somewhere in that series. <laughs> I'm sure, she she seems like she could get in there and meddle about some uh, yeah some uh, drama. Right. Sarah, is there um, anything happening around Meg's story? Um, not on my end, but there is actually a French series where she's one of the characters, um, and I think it's more about her relationship with uh, Faure and not the murders. It's called Paris Police 1900. I haven't been able to see it. Um, and it looks like a gorgeous costume drama. And I think the casting is brilliant. So one of these days, I'm going to see it. Um, and, you know, I hope that the actress, who's an incredible actress, Evelyn Brochu, did her justice. Any other questions? What are you all working on now? It sounds like it's been a long time. Right. 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 Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm playing with a project that that um, Sarah might <laughs> might be able to help me with because I'm interested in the Gilded Age women who fled to Paris. This is pre 1920s Paris. We all know about that. The the women who lit out and 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 were able to create in ways that they couldn't in America. But there was a crop that that came before them who were the real pioneers, who paved the way. They had no roadmap, nothing. And they went over there and they really lived with a capital L. <laughs> and, and that would be a really interesting project. Uh, it's, it would, again, involve a lot of research, a lot of time, but the stories are just as colorful as Miriam Leslie's and uh, and, I, and Meg's too. <laughs> that sounds like some tough research. <laughs> Sarah, how about you? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? The question yes. is um, what projects you are working on currently. Oh, well, I'm not quite sure. I am... Uh, I've not had a lot of time, but there's a woman who is actually Meg Dizek contemporary, Leanne de Pougy, who really interests me. Um, she was a writer. She uh, was a courtesan. She had a wild life. Um, and um, she, you know, wrote like her diary memoirs. She was a journalist. 
Um, and then eventually she became a princess. Uh, she married a Romanian prince. Um, he had no money. She had all the money. And then she decided to become a nun at the end of her life. So I'm sort of looking around her, but I, yeah, I haven't quite figured it out yet. Thank you. We might have time for one more if there's anything else. I will, um, I'll give a final question. Um, I'm curious um, as to whether or not you still have unanswered questions about these women after researching, writing, living with them um, in your world for so long. Is there something um, you would ask them or of them? In my case, I was dealing with a very complicated woman. And I would have liked to have explored some of the psychological questions that I couldn't follow up. Um, one of them, one thing that totally baffles me was her social aspiration. She was determined to breach high society. It was a ridiculous reach. And she was disqualified on every count. She was a triple uh, divorcee. Um, a person in the professions that was absolutely verboten and uh, she was from nowhere and yet uh, it was a lifelong passion and all she could do was write about the people in the 400 who lived on Olympus and that kind of thing it was bizarre you would think with all that she achieved and when you think of this narrow dull a parochial society and why she would want to belong to them. It's very baffling to me that it's a psychological quandary. Um, that, that really fascinates me and her disidentification with the poor. That also is something that baffles me because she herself grew up in dire poverty and here she is mixed race and yet she was bigoted and she was snobbish and all of those things are questions that even psychiatry can't figure out right now. And I would love to probe that a little bit more. I was left a little bit baffled. I was also left at the end both disliking her and liking her. Admiring her is the best word. Um, and, and that's a complicated feeling to have as a biographer because, you know, you like to feel that you have more empathy for the person that you write about and live with really for so long. And yet I'm sort of confused about why I was so conflicted as I wrote the book. Sarah, were you able to answer that one? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. So I have lots of questions about the murder, but I think actually if I could talk to her, um, I, maybe somewhat similar to Betsy, I would ask her if she had any regrets if she would have done anything differently. Um, I think that there are lots of ways in which her life was tragic. And I think she would have married a different man had she sort of known what she was getting into in a lot of respects. But, um, you know, I she's someone who didn't seem to have a lot of self-insight, but I do kind of wonder if she ever felt bad about framing innocent people, planting evidence, um, you know, covering up a murder. Uh, I think she was immensely cruel to her husband. Um, and I, I think I would really be interested in hearing her sort of talk about if she would have done any of that differently. Thank you both so much. This has been quite a pleasure and thank you for coming. Now, um, 